those requirements for patent protection that we started to talk about last time, um, because uh, you're going to need to know these before we get into actually how to file a patent application. So not only um, do we want to know why we're filing a patent application, we've sort of covered that, but what the um, requirements of patent protection are is the second most important thing. And on Tuesday, when we're back here, we're actually going to do a patent application. So by way of, by way of somewhat of a review, when we were together last time, there were four requirements for patent protection, statutory, new, useful, and non-obvious. Um, the statutory requirement we, we went over, you know, the United States Code has the broadest uh, description of what is patentable. It states that processes, machines, articles of manufacture, and compositions of matter are all patentable. Again, it's about as broad as you can get. Um, and it's the broadest, uh, as, as far as I can tell, it's the broadest description in the world of what is patentable. So we, we were also we were starting to talk about the novelty requirement. Um, in order for an invention to be patentable, it must also be new, as that term is defined in patent law. This novelty requirement states that an invention cannot be patented if certain public disclosures of the invention have been made, which kind of go to the point that we were talking about before class involving NDAs. Anybody know, does everybody know what an NDA is? Exactly. You're all going to have one stuck under your nose one day, I guarantee it. Or you're going to be sticking one under somebody else's nose one day. What's the purpose of a non-disclosure agreement? I at least insofar as it relates to intellectual property. If you're the president of Coca-Cola and you're hiring a new person on and uh, you're going to give them the a combination of, of, of the Coca-Cola safe, you want to have them sign an NDA? And why is that? I saw some heads going up and down. Why? Why? Please. You don't want your employees to like show your secrets. Exactly. You want to, tr you want to treat trade secrets uh, or intellectual property uh, like what it is. If you don't treat trade secrets like a trade secret, then the courts won't treat it as a secret. So in that way, NDAs are an essential part of intellectual property law insofar as they satisfy or help to satisfy the novelty requirement. Because as we'll find out, when you disclose something, when it's out there and you don't try to protect it, then you run the risk of failing to satisfy the novelty requirement. So NDAs are not there just because somebody wants to be onerous. NDAs are there because the law requires novelty in order for intellectual property rights to be uh, respected or um, to be enforceable, especially as, as it relates to patent law. So um, the novelty requirement requires uh, or states that an invention cannot be patented if certain public disclosures have been made. So, uh, I want to introduce a new term to you, which is called, which is prior art. We've talked about it a little bit here, but the term prior art includes all types of activities, such as disclosures in printed publications, sales or commercial use of a product, uh, published or issued patents, all, in, all uh, are included as prior art. So significantly, disclosures that are made in confidence to third parties will usually not consider prior art. That's where the NDA comes in, okay? So let's go through some examples, maybe. If you have an, in, if you've come up with an invention here at MIT for a better mousetrap, and you uh, write a paper uh, in Mousetrap Technology magazine, uh, the uh, preeminent peer-reviewed magazine uh, for mousetrap manufacturers and uh, technologists, um, does that constitute a disclosure? 
some heads sort of nodding in agreement uh, with a certain amount of certainty. Of course it does. If you go out there and you publish something, especially in technical literature that describes your invention, then it becomes, then it's prior art. It's prior art. It's out there. Prior art is just a general term that describes uh, inventions that are out there. Likewise, if you, um, if you come up with a better mousetrap and you go to the mousetrap uh, convention, uh, and you try to raise some capital by uh, selling your invention uh, at the mousetrap uh, convention, um, is that, um, is that, does that constitute a disclosure that would render your invention part of prior art? Again, of course it would. If you go down to your banker and you say, look, I've come up with this great invention. I need, 10, 000, I need a $10,000 loan. Does that constitute prior art? The answer is most likely it does. Most likely it does, unless you have that banker sign an NDA, or unless you have whoever it is you disclose this to sign an NDA. You're down at, um, what's the pizza place over here? Yeah, so you're having a couple of drinks, you're having a pizza, you're a little tipsy, you start talking mousetraps like you always do, and somebody sits down next to you who happens to also be a mousetrap fan, and you say, and you whisper in their ear, and you say, I've come up with a great new invention or a way of making a mousetrap, and you describe your invention. Is that a public disclosure such as your invention becomes part of the prior art? You bet your life it does. Better carry, especially if you're if you're prone to talking about uh, your, uh, your inventions, you better carry an NDA with you. Because if you don't have, if you don't take steps to protect your invention, it becomes prior art. Now, the other form of prior art is if, you, if, if there's a patent issue on it already. You have your hand up. Are these things after you've already filed the patent? Or no, these are before, OK? So what we're talking about now uh, is basically the definition of prior art as it relates to the novelty requirement. So in order for something to be patent patentable, it needs to be novel. And it's not novel if it's part of the prior art. That's what I'm trying to uh, point out. So if you talk about it with your friends, if you publish it in a magazine, if you try to raise money or if you sell it, if there are any commercial activities around it, that's a disclosure. Uh, I should, maybe I should come up with a new, new, uh, new slide calling it, uh, the cat is out of the bag. Once the cat is out of the bag, it becomes part of the prior art. And then depending upon what country you live in, whether it's an absolute novelty or a relative novelty country, uh, it may or may not be patentable, and we'll go into that. But one of the things you need to be conscious of, and one of the reasons why people stick NDAs under your noses all the time, or will, uh, is because they're conscious of the fact that they have to protect their intellectual property, uh, either uh, intellectual property that has been uh, uh, registered and protected, or is in the process of being developed uh, with the view towards patenting it uh, in, at some future time. Usually, folks like you get involved in the research and development phase, probably the development phase, and that's when the NDAs uh, start, uh, being, start flying around. Uh, it's, there's usually a phase, a, a period of time, where you have to get your uh, technological act together in order to file the preliminary patent application. So it's usually at that phase when the NDAs start flying around and, and, and uh, it's terribly important that uh, you follow that, that rule when attempting to um, uh, prosecute one of your inventions. All right. Um, the statute which <coughs> explains when a public disclosure has been made is a pretty complicated one. Yes? The United States is a relative novelty uh, country. 
Um, it, it, in, in the United States, as we'll go into, uh, there's a one-year grace period. So from the, date that you, from the date that you whisper in your friend's ear at the bar or publish a paper uh, or demonstrate your invention in some public way or sell it, in the United States, you have a one-year grace period. But if you want to prosecute your patent in other countries, most other countries are absolute novelty countries. Uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so the advice I give to everybody that walks in to my door is, in addition to having those NDAs at the ready, you file a preliminary patent application uh, before you do anything that could possibly be conceived of as prior art. So before you talk about it, write about it, demonstrate it, sell it, try to raise money about it, uh, exploit it commercially in any way, or even tell your mom and dad about it, file a preliminary patent application. Because if you don't file that preliminary patent application, it's something, and it's something, for instance, that you want to market to 1.2 billion people in China, then you will not be able to commercially exploit that because China happens to be an absolute novelty jurisdiction. So you can file a preliminary patent application here in the United States within that one year grace period. But if you go to China and you want to file a patent application there, you're going to ask about prior art and you're going to say, well, I published it in this, uh, in this, in this paper. Um, which is okay in the United States, they're going to say, too bad. It's in the public domain. It's part of prior art. And they will not grant you a patent application. Yes? Is there some kind of reciprocity between countries here? If you, you file for a patent in the United States, obviously we're not filing you know, every country that you may want to market it simultaneously, or do you have to? Well, um, it's, it's funny you should say that. Uh, actually, the, the question might, might be better put by other countries, because the United States was the last country practically in the world to come along to the first to file uh, system. So uh, the United States sort of was brought into the first to file system kicking and screaming all the way in 2011. We, we didn't join the rest of the world until, until 2011, which, which caused problems because there is not absolute reciproc reciprocity. Um, the, there are small differences from country to country, um, and this is one of, the, one of the details that you need to be aware of. So this is why when you come into my office and you say, Steve, I'm thinking of publishing this patent paper pair, you know, I'm going to say, file the application first. Because usually what happens is you go to China, you file your patent application, your patent application is granted, and then somebody comes along and files a cancellation action, asking the Chinese government to uh, cancel your patent application. And the grounds that they'll offer is this paper that you wrote back here in the United States. And the Chinese authorities will look at it and they'll say, too bad. Uh, we're an absolute novelty country. You should know that. You should have listened uh, to uh, Steve Lyons when he told you that you should file a patent application before you publish in any way. You're out of luck. And then 1.2 billion consumers for your mousetrap or whatever it happens to be are out the window. So you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to take those kinds of chances. And if it's scary to hear that, it should be. Because uh, uh, everyone that walks into my office, every student that has an idea, the first thing I say to them is file a preliminary patent application. Don't tell anybody about this yet. Yes, sir. And for you know, uh, young or for entrepreneurs like, trying to do their ventures, uh, you know, forty twenty thousand dollars is a lot of money. You're you're right, and we're getting into Tuesday's lecture. But the but the idea is to file what's called a preliminary patent application, which is actually very simple and inexpensive to do, and you can think of it as sort of a placeholder, okay, while you get your act together. Um, patents do eventually cost money. You have to hire graphic artists. You have to do a prior art research. Um, you have to 
hire lawyers to, you know, prepare the claims and the abstracts and all the other things that go into a, um, a, a final patent application. But a preliminary patent application is really simple and inexpensive. So, and, and what it can be done, what, can you, what you can do with a preliminary patent application is you can convert it to a, a full and final patent application. So it's, it's really not an onerous uh, burden on an inventor. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, like I said, think of it as like getting your foot in the door. Um, and eventually you can mature it, you can finish the development of the product, you can improve the claim section, you can change the abstract, you can, you can, you, you can file something like this uh, on day one, and on day 364, <coughs> which is the last day you'll have, you have one year to file a full patent application, you can file something like this. So um, it's, it's really not an onerous burden, but you know, you're, you're, you're beginning the journey and you need, to be, you, know, you need to be aware of that. So until then, keep your ideas to yourself. You know what I mean? Uh, keep your research, protect your research and, and make sure that it doesn't get disclosed uh, in, in any way. But the preliminary patent application um, in fact, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll probably leave uh, a few minutes early so that you can all go and at some point I'm going to give you 15 minutes so that between now and next Tuesday you can all, we, all go to the United, United States Patent and Trademark website, navigate it for 10 minutes, and, and you can see how a preliminary patent application is, uh, is prepared. It's real simple. And we're going to do one next Tuesday. Simple as pie. Yes? Oh, well, that's, 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 that's when you come to my office. <laughs> um, what happens if somebody on your team breaks the NDA? Uh, and um, then what do you do? Um, well, they're liable. They, they could very well be liable for very significant damages. Um, and those NDAs are, are, you know, they're meaningful documents. Um, if there is a, a violation of an NDA, you know, there are usually remedies uh, specified in the NDA, um, but um, usually that's when, unfortunately, somebody like me comes into the picture. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the problem. Uh, uh, one member of the team can upset the whole apple cart. Yeah. Yes? Does the same thing apply to public, I mean, to universities like MIT? Because, uh, <laughs> Most students are not aware, but as soon as you enter, MIT gives you a few documents to sign, and one of those is an NDA, where you cannot disclose anything you have done inside the university. That's why, for instance, my advisor allows you to talk clearly about all your research topics in a group meeting, because the people cannot do anything with that. Well, because everybody's, everybody signed an NDA. Yeah, so oh. Yeah, so if, if, as long as you have everybody signed up to an NDA, you know, you can talk all of you, all you want within, within your group. Um, is there like the, a transitive property? I mean, if, uh, if you sign a con an NDA with MIT and MIT signs an NDA with external companies, uh, so practically everything is still uh, protected for the company or not? Um, what's the answer to every legal question? It depends. I'd have to see the NDAs. Uh, you know, I really have to know more about the circumstances. But the scenario that you suggest is possible, okay, um, with properly drawn agreements. Um, but, you know, it depends, okay? Yes? The craziest case I've ever worked on. You, you, you know, I, I worked on one once where the parties each spent nearly a million dollars in legal fees fighting over a trademark that was just a jumble of capital letters that meant nothing to anyone but the two parties. And I spent half of my time saying, look, just rearrange the letters. Take this B and put it over here. And they wouldn't do it. Um, we were talking at the end of class the other day about the CRISPR decision. 
Um, you know, there's the University of Southern California and there's the Broad Institute over here fighting over um, uh, this uh, method of, uh, of manipulating genes. Um, and um, they've spent millions in legal fees. Both, both own patents. Both have filed cross petitions to cancel each other's patents. Um, both have patents that are arguably sort of overlapping. They're only good for 20 years. They've been in litigation now, I think, for seven years. They only have another 12 years left. Meanwhile, everybody, rather than license uh, their technology or get in or, or, um, or um, get involved in the fight, um, have either licensed the technology from both or are conducting research into def different methodologies. What I, what I, the cr craziest litigation I see is where people kind of get into these um, fights that are based entirely on ego and bragging rights and have really nothing <laughs> to do with commercial exploitation of their ideas, which, by the way, is the whole idea for intellectual property protection in the first place. So, you know, um, every, I guess every lawyer has st stories about people who fight for stupid reasons. And that those, and I, I get those all the time. I, I really do. Oftentimes, you know, I, I, I get cases where big companies are taking advantage of little people or little companies and things like that. But honestly, so many, so of, oftentimes it's, it's two sort of equally matched parties that are willing to spend themselves into oblivion for something that nobody in the whole world cares about except for the two of them. So uh, don't get too attached to um, an acronym. That's, I guess, my advice. Uh, um, anyhow, the statute that uh, talks about when a public disclosure has been made is, is pretty technical and complicated, um, but um, basically the, the, it boils down to whether the, the invention was known to the public before it was invented by the individual seeking patent protection. How can it be known to the public? Published, patented, right? Invented in some way before. All right, um, so if it was described in a publication uh, or uh, used publicly or offered for sale uh, at, at any period uh, prior to one year, um, you're, you're, you're in trouble. And that's in a relative novelty state, uh, country. Uh, one of the most uh, important lessons to learn, we've already gone over this, is that there's a one-year period after the first public disclosure or offer for sale of a device or an invention um, which, um, which you have, which the United States Patent and Trademark Office will recognize. Um, but again, my advice is file that preliminary patent application before you disclose publicly in any way, especially when it comes to um, writing a paper or something about it. And uh, as, as the slide points out, th this grace period is unforgiving. If, if the United States Patent and Trademark Office finds that you've been talking about your invention or publishing it or raising money or demonstrating it publicly in some way uh, more than one year prior to your filing of the preliminary patent application, you're out. It's in the public domain. Anybody can have it. Yes, sir. That's right. That, that's, that's the purpose of an NDA. You know, and that's why I tell everybody file the preliminary patent application. I mean, it, honestly, when you go on the white website, you, you'll see an idiot can do it. I mean, it really is not that complicated. It will, will in 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 20 minutes next week, we'll all be experts on how to file one of these things. But you're absolutely right. You know, it's it's you don't want to get into those fights. The one thing you always want to do is avoid litigation. You want to you want to avoid bringing people like me in. Yes, sir. Uh, for instance, a reason such as um, Uber, Fabinbo, as in not just the algorithms that, you know, I just came up with this idea, this is how things are going to work, and I'm going to button the whole, the whole business. Generally, remember what we were talking about. Systems are generally not patentable. You know, a way of doing business, an idea, a ride-sharing idea is not patentable. Um, but... 
There may be specific algorithms that you use in your, you know, in, in your Uber um, app, which are copyrightable, okay, or which possibly could be patented. Um, so, you know, you, it, it's like a bottle of Coca-Cola. You know, there's a half a dozen different patentable uh, elements that go into a bottle of Coca-Cola. And what goes into the bottle is dozens of patentable uh, processes and materials uh, in and of itself. So, y you know, you have to really look at it in a more in a granular way and find out what's really important. You know, the there are a million. There's Uber, there's Lyft, there's all kinds of ride-sharing services. But what makes yours unique? What makes yours novel? What makes yours useful in ways that differentiate it? That could very well be subject to intellectual property uh, rights either by patent or, or by, um, well, uh, obviously a trademark if you come up with something clever, or by copyright. You know, so you want to, you know, you want to be aware of, of, you want to take a look at a business at a granular level, and, and, and you may not be able to protect the notion of a ride-sharing idea, but there might be something unique about your idea which is subject to intellectual property protection, and that's what you want to uh, focus in on. That's the thing you want to protect anyhow. Who cares if somebody comes up with a ride-sharing idea uh, as long as you have something novel about yours that makes yours faster or better or cheaper or more reliable, right? You know, who, who, wouldn't be, who wouldn't want to be able to get an Uber in one minute? You know, so maybe there is some way of doing that um, that you can then patent. And then you license it to Uber and Lyft and everybody else and that's how you make your money. So. Um, so, um, so we, we talked about this, just explaining your invention to anybody, a coworker, without any, obli without any obligation of confidentiality. That's the NDA. Uh, we'll start this clock ticking. Um, one year uh, in the United States, uh, other places uh, not so much. So each country has its own specific rules. Uh, here's uh, the absolute novelty uh, countries. Um, uh, China, Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Spain. I mean, the whole common market, 320 million consumers. Uh, most of Asia, 1.2 billion consumers. Uh, so if you're, nowadays, you know, the world has shrunk so much when it comes to inventions. You know, really, uh, a lot of my clients, they're selling their stuff in China. You know, because that's such an exploitable market. Um, so you really want to be conscious of the intellectual property requirements of the market that you want to exploit. In the old days, it was just, you know, you'd start by selling it in your town, in your city, in your state, in your region. Nobody ever thought beyond the borders of the United States. But now um, uh, you have to think globally. And so that's why the United States finally, in 2011, with the America Invents Act, Act came into the 21st century. We're finally part of the rest of the world. Uh, and that makes it easier for our inventors. We still have that one year grace period. Who knows how long it will, it will last. As you know, you know, as we learned last time, these laws evolve and at some point uh, we, may, um, we may get rid of that law, as a, uh, that grace period. And as a practical matter today, the grace period is gone. If you come into my office, I'm going to act like the grace period doesn't, it doesn't even exist. Because it's so important for you to be competitive in markets that have slightly different rules. All right. So here's the big test. Uh, if inventor A publicly discloses or sells the invention prior to filing of a patent application, is it patentable in the United States? If you disclose prior to filing the patent application, is it patentable in the United States? <coughs> no. Why not? As long as you do it within a year, though, if you do it within a year, if you file within a year, then it is patentable. Um, at, because the United States is a relative novelty country. But if you try to do the same thing in an absolute novelty country, like China, Japan, most of South America, Europe, you're going to be out of luck. All right. So generally speaking, absolute novelty versus relative novelty. 
Um, if an inventor publicly discloses or sells the invention prior to the filing of a patent application, that, uh, that disclosure will render that patent ultimately uh, invalid for lack of novelty. So again, we're just talking about the novelty requirement. Uh, in the United States, however, you have that one-year grace period. When in doubt, file a, prelim a preliminary patent applic a provisional patent application. You can also call it's also called a, a preliminary patent application. So, if obtaining a patent protection outside the United States is important, it's often prudent. I think I should change that slide. It's essential. It's mandatory. Um, you don't have a choice. Uh, you have to file a, a, a priority patent application. In the United States, that's called a preliminary patent or uh, provisional patent application before any disclosure. We go back to our, I think it was our second lecture where we talked about patent paper pairs. Everybody, when they're filing a, 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 uh, a paper now, uh, remember the, the graphene paper and uh, the other things that we discussed, the dissemination of knowledge and all that. Patent paper pairs are really common. Why? Because of the novelty requirement. Novelty, novelty, novelty. It's, 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 it's an essential part of determining whether or not your invention is patentable. So everybody files basically on the same day that they publish a paper, a preliminary or provisional patent application, or whatever it is that you're seeking to protect. That's um, the smart thing to do. All right, so we've covered statutory, we've, cons we've considered no novelty. So what about usefulness, um, the, the, the third requirement? But useful in this context refers to the condition that the subject or the invention has a useful pur purpose. If it just sits there and doesn't do anything, then it doesn't satisfy the usefulness requirement and you're out, unless, of course, it's a design patent. We've talked about design patents, which really don't do anything, I guess you could say you could argue they convey a certain uh, corporate image or goodwill. Uh, so what they do is sort of in a, is, is what they do is I guess in a passive sense they do something. But um, if it doesn't do what, it is, what it's claimed to do, or if it's not useful in some way, then the third requirement, mandatory requirement of usefulness is not met. Um, so if a if a device doesn't operate, you're not going to get it patented. If a mousetrap doesn't catch mice, uh, if a incandescent bulb doesn't light up, uh, if uh, data doesn't stream, then you're not going to, you're not going to uh, satisfy the usefulness requirement, and it won't be patentable. Um, there's some Recent litigation like CRISPR and uh, other uh, advances in uh, science have sort of tested the usefulness requirement. Um, there's been a lot of debate about whether, for instance, isolated genetic materials of various types fulfill the requirement of usefulness. Um, think about gene sequencing. We have more gene sequencing now than, than well, in the last 20 years, um, it's it's just simply exploded. So, um, uh, in fact, I, I quote here the Newfield uh, Council on Bioethics that states, since the development of large-scale DNA sequencing techniques over the past 10 years, more DNA sequences have become available without a concomitant understanding of their function. As a result, many patent applications have been filed on genes or parts of genes without the de demonstration of a credible utility, all right? Now, this is related to the usefulness requirement. And this, again, I keep mentioning the CRISPR decision. We'll, we'll go over it in one of our classes. But with gene sequencing, oftentimes those who are responsible for the gene sequencing do not foresee or cannot demonstrate a usefulness uh, or more than one usefulness, even though there are many potential usefulness uh, of the genes, gene editing or gene sequencing technique. Um, and so when they file their claims, they try to file as broad a claim as possible to cover as many potential uses of the gene editing technology. But the question now in the courts, and the one that we're 
literally struggling with as we sit here today is what is this usefulness requirement compel us to do when it comes to gene editing? Um, and the, the, the answer seems to be if you can't demonstrate a usefulness. So in other words, it's not just good enough to think of potential uses for your gene editing sequencing uh, or manipulation technology. You must have already demonstrated it. You must have already shown in the laboratory that it's, for instance, a, a vector for, um, uh, uh, you, for uh, curing some sort of disease. Um, you must have some way of having demonstrated, not just theoretically, but in the laboratory, the usefulness of that gene uh, editing or sequencing technology. Um, now, what again, I keep coming back to the Broad and uh, University of Southern California, but you know, their lawyers tried to file as broad a claim as they possibly could to cover, to cover, create an umbrella for and protection for as many um, uses as they can, as were uh, uh, imaginable. But uh, in the CRISPR decision, the USPTO decided that if, you, if it was just theoretical, if you, if you hadn't demonstrated it in a laboratory, then you don't own it because you haven't satisfied the usefulness requirement. So it has to be, it has to have credible utility. Um, can't just be theoretical. You have to have somehow shown it in the lab that it works. Uh, going back to the mousetrap idea, it has to be able to catch mice. If you can't demonstrate that it can do that, then it's probably not protectable. Only that which you can demonstrate is protectable because it has credible utility. Gene patents have been criticized on this basis. This is basically just what we've been talking about uh, because uh, the patent holder wants to protect any number of possible applications even though these may be unattainable or unproven. The key word here is possible. Possible is really, I don't think, patentable these days. You can be absolutely certain that somebody's going to come along and file an application um, to um, cancel your patent because you have not been able to demonstrate that you've been able to, uh, that, that your invention, your gene sequencing, your editing technology has credible utility. Um, in, the, in the CRISPR uh, decision, unfortunately, you know, the people that wanted to enforce the patent were so happy when they uh, had uh, actually created this gene sequencing technology that they gave all kinds of interviews to the press about what their technology could do and what they, and what they had not been able to demonstrate that it could do. And, Five years later, when they were litigating this case, those statements to the press came back to haunt them because the scientists, not thinking at the time, having never taken a course like this, had never speak, having never spoken to me, went out there and started telling you know, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times what their technology could do, what they demonstrated in the lab, and what they were still yet to be able to demonstrate. And the Broad Institute came along and said, well, we've now demonstrated that we can do this. We want the patent on this. And that's who won. The people that, that and, and, those, and the statements that scientists made to the press about what their editing technology could and could not do was fundamental to the USPTO's decision regarding credible utility. The USPTO said, you, own, you can own this much, but you can't own what is possible. You can own what you can demonstrate, but you can't own what you say is possible that you haven't demonstrated. Yes? Let's say when you find the patent application on that, you can demonstrate only a part of it. If after you manage to demonstrate what you thought was possible, can you add, uh, add it to the claims? Or? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, you can always amend. You can always, or file a new patent application. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. But if it's speculative or if it's theoretical or if it's not demonstrated, if you can't hold it in your hand, it ain't patentable. Yes, sir. So what about in the case where something is speculative when you actually file the patent? By the time, say, five years later when you're actually litigating, you have 
are able to demonstrate it now, does that count as well, or would that not fulfill the requirement? What's the answer? It depends. Well, and, and here's, here's how it depends. What if somebody has come up in the meantime and been able to demonstrate it in their laboratory using their ingenuity, their funding, their investment? And they file a, 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 a preliminary patent application. And, you're, and you have not demonstrated it. Or let's say you demonstrate it after they file the preliminary patent application. Who wins that one? First to file. First to file. Whoever is first to file. OK? If, if, when, if your patent only covers those claims with demonstrable utility, Okay, then it doesn't cover everything else. And if somebody else comes along and, and using your technology advances it and demonstrates it, its utility for some other purpose, then that's, I think that's patentable. I think they own that. Now, get ready because you're going to spend millions in you know, cross applications to cancel and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's usually the result of those things, especially with something that's as commercially exploitable as, you know, gene editing technology because of, a, you know, just the, you know, the engulfment of our corporations that are involved in that. But that's, that's usually the outcome. If it hasn't been demonstrated, whatever you do, tell your scientists, don't go to the press and say, gee, you know, we can do this, but we can't do this. We're still working on this because that's an open door for someone to fly in and do that. And that's what the Broad Institute did. And they came up with it. And they own it, you know, because they were able to demonstrate it. All right, the non-obviousness requirement. This is like a weird thing, but, um, and, and this requirement drives me crazy because it's so subjective. All right, so what is the non-obvious requirement? So it has to be statutory. It has to be novel or new. It has to be useful, right? So the fourth one is non-obviousness. If an invention is not exactly the same as prior products or processes, which are referred to, as we know, as prior art, then it is considered novel. However, in order for an invention to be patentable, it must also be non-obvious or a non-obvious improvement on the prior art. And this determination is made by deciding whether or not the invention sought to be patented would have been obvious to one of ordinary skill. All right, so if you're inventing a linkage system for a gas pedal to a throttle, um, it may not be obvious to you and me because I don't know anything about mechanics. But if I'm a automotive mechanic and it's obvious to me, then it doesn't satisfy the non-obvious requirement. That's what to one of ordinary skill in the art. If you're a gene editing scientist, that's the person of ordinary skill in the art standard that, it, that, that the obviousness requirement um, pertains to. In the CRISPR decision, the University of Southern California said, this is obvious. This, the, you know, the, these, these processes, the, even though we hadn't demonstrated them, uh, and the Broad went in and, and then ultimately did what our scientists couldn't do, they shouldn't have the patent on it because really what they've done is built on our technology. And what they've done is obvious, not to you and me, but to someone in the gene editing scientific world. And that's when, that, that's what trials are made out of. And that's where witnesses, <laughs> experts on each side come in. You bring in experts in gene editing that work, uh, that are hired by the Broad Institute. They talk about how this gene editing sequencing technology is not an obvious advance. And they have the experts that come from the other side that say it is an obvious advance. And then there's cross-examination. And usually the cross-examination is, well, Mr. or Mr. Or Mr. Ex expert, did you know that the scientists for um, the plaintiff in your case uh, gave a, an interview to the New York Times that said that this was not doable, that they had tried to do it and they couldn't. How do you explain? How do you reconcile that? How, how, do you, how can you argue that this, is not, that, that this is obvious when your own scientists admitted in the papers that they couldn't do it? So 
Obviousness is a subjective thing. It depends on the people in the, the skill of the people in the ordinary art. Um, and so whether or not it is a significant advance in prior art really is a terrible, subjective, pain in the neck sort of standard that you have to deal with. And that's what trials are made of. That's literally what 12 people, many of whom never don't even have high school educations, decide. That's, that's the juries that, that you try these cases in front of. You don't try them in front of scientists or technologists. You try them in front of 12 people that never had a science class in their life, most of them. Anyhow, the basic obviousness requirements was, uh, were laid down by the uh, court in uh, Graham versus uh, John Deere. Um, and basically, these are the rules. Determine the scope and content of the prior art. Ascertain the differences between the claimed invention and the prior art. Are there any advances? Resolve the level of ordinary skill in the pertinent art. And consider objective indicia of non-obviousness. Are there secondary considerations of non-obviousness that suggest a patent should issue despite an invention seeming to be obvious? The question basically comes down to, does it advance? Is it new? Is it, has it advanced the ball in any way scientifically? Um, and the, the, again, this, this subjective standard is what we're, what we're really dealing with here. The, the purpose of uh, the inventive step or non-obviousness Another word for non-obviousness is inventiveness. Um, is to avoid granting patents on inventions that um, really don't, don't advance the art. Why do you want to grant somebody a, a monopoly on something that really doesn't represent an advance in scientific knowledge? And this is the, these are the fundamental questions that courts really wrestle with when they are dealing with this non-obviousness uh, requirement. Uh, the non-obvious bar is thus a, a measure of what society accepts as a valuable discovery. It, remember we talked about historically how it had to be important and how with the 1952 Act we did away with the importance requirements? Well, the importance requirement has sort of slipped back in with this very subjective non-obviousness standard. And I, I only mention it here because it really is the fourth element that's necessary in order for something to be patentable. And you need to be conscious of it. Um, this um, uh, Teleflex case, I can, I can, I can um, su summarize it for you in one word. It's the most important Supreme Court decision on the non-obviousness test. And what the Supreme Court says is non-obviousness is a common sense test. But they didn't define what common sense means. So again, we get back to that very subjective standard. And it's going to differ from, from case to case. All right, if you want to look at the obviousness factors, this will be up on the board for you. I just wanted to maybe do one fun example of obviousness because I get this question wrong every year, and it's my question. So um, in order to satisfy the non-obviousness uh, requirement, some changes known to products which would not normally be patentable are the substitution of one material for another, you know, non-obvious. Changes in size, right? Or changes in color. I mean, if that's the only thing you're doing to improve the prior art, then it doesn't satisfy the non-obviousness requirement. So if, for instance, uh, you were inventing a new thermos and you decided to make it out of, make it red instead of titanium, that probably isn't patentable because you haven't advanced the art. That's an obvious change. All right, so the fourth element, non-obviousness, is not met. And here's the question I get wrong every year. And it's my question. Is this patentable? The claim, which this comes from the patent application, a blade for a ceiling fan, said blade incorporating or constructed of phosphorescent materials, said ceiling fan being arranged for attachment to a ceiling. I wonder who thought that up. All right, now going back. Why does it always do that to me? All right, we're talking about a phosphorescent ceiling fan. Not normally patentable, our substitution of one material for another. 
Changes in size, changes in color. So what do you think? Did the patent examiner uh, allow this or not? What do you think? Oh, that, that's very, is he right? Is he correct? Anybody got any other ideas? Yes? Even though it's just changing the material and the process that it takes for the, uh, the blade to work, it's probably different, so it's like this technology. Well, you're all smarter than I am. Because when I first came across this, I swore up and down that just changing the material is no way that's patentable. But, um, but, but they granted patent number 8,622,700. And I'll, and I'll show you, Here's, this is exactly what you said. This is the abstract, and this is what got them the patent application. People, especially children, need a small amount of illumination to orient themselves and navigate around a darkened room. Children often have trouble calming themselves down at bedtime. Finding the fan and light controls on a ceiling fan is a difficult task. Ceiling fan blades and hardware that incorporate phosphorescent materials address each of these problems. They provide a night light effect without using electricity. They create pleasing and soothing artistic effects when the fan is rotating. Phosphorescent fan controls or, illusion, or, or illumination from other components of the invention with phosphorescent surfaces allow for easy navigation in darkened room. Some really smart lawyer came up with that, I'm, I'm telling you. Um, uh, because to me, substituting phosphorescent materials uh, for, um, uh, for normal fan blades does not, in my mind, represent a significant enough advance in the art to satisfy the novelty or non-obviousness requirement, but I'm wrong, apparently. I think if this goes to another patent examiner, I might be right. And by the way, there's a picture of it. So do your patent get rejected, or do the issue for your patent get rejected um, if it's based on one examiner? Right. Do you um, access a different examiner? There's an appeal process, um, and um, you can go through the appeal process. You usually, when you file a patent application, you really have a dialogue with the claims examiner. And I got to tell you, the patent, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is full of people with tremendous knowledge. Most of them with engineering degrees from places like this. And they spend their whole life on fan blades. That's all they do. Or mousetraps. Or gene editing technology. Or aircraft engine fan blades. That's all they do. And so you will have a dialogue with them. And I imagine that this abstract that they came up with was the result of the dialogue that they had with the patent examiner who said, look, I'm not going to give this to you. And then the person said, well, but what about the soothing effect it creates? And what about the fact that it sort of provides a light source before you can find the light? The next thing you know, they've convinced the patent examiner. So I imagine this was not the first iteration of this abstract, this application. I think that over time it probably was amended and ultimately accepted. Um, but, but yeah, there's, a, there's an appellate process that you can go through, but the thing that really, where it really develops is during the dialogue that you have with the examiner. Um, How many times can you appeal? Uh, well, you, well, you can go all the way to the Supreme Court if you want, but within the United States Patent and Trademark Office, um, there's one appellate level, and then you appeal to what's called the TTAB, the uh, Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, and if you don't like their decision, then you can go to the, first, uh, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals or any federal circuit in the United States. And if you don't like that decision, you, get a, you go to the United States Supreme Court. But that's spent a lot of money. You, you're better off having a dialogue with the examiner or coming up with, uh, with something that actually meets the novelty and the non-obviousness requirements. All right. All right, next week, Tuesday, breakfast. And before you walk out of this room next Tuesday, I promise you, you'll know how to file a preliminary patent application.